start tonight. She is uh, presently, I think, studying a PhD at University of Western Ontario. Olivia is going to talk about flag football hybrid as well. So Olivia, I'm definitely looking forward to you telling us a little bit more about that. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Olivia. Take it away. Awesome. Okay. I love it. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm going to go through things fairly briefly and hopefully provide some tips on um, this kind of athlete centric, which is a term I'm going to coin throughout this presentation on how you can build programs that integrate, not just yourselves as coaches and delivering programming, but also what that looks like when you put the athletes in charge of that. So that's what I meant by what I mean by athlete centric and then building or an introduction into contact flag and what that looks like from our league's perspective. So a bit about me, um, uh, Richard already did, or Rick already did a really nice intro for me. So I'm from Mississauga, Ontario. I grew up in the Peel region, meaning that I actually had the opportunity of playing flag football starting in grade six it was a part of our curriculum. And then, um, of course, we had the varsity team at my high school, and that's where I got my first uh, foot into the football world. Um, only was playing 7v7 flag, which is fairly common across the board here in Canada. But um, over time, and as I moved through my academic career and moving into university, um, I started exploring other opportunities to keep playing. And so I went to Western. I've been here since uh, 2014. I've been at Western for a while now. Um, and I joined the what was our football program then in 2015. It was formerly um, known as powder puff football in this league, but we've completely moved away from that term. It's now just football generally, um, and women's football generally. And we play, uh, and we play this hybrid version of the game, which I'll talk about at the end of this presentation. Um, and my work has really started, um, fairly later. So 2015, I was playing, but it was until not until 2017, where I started to to uh, see that there's a need to build the women's side of programming. Like, how do we get more women in the game? How do we make this game exciting and competitive for athletes? So that's where I'm growing and pushing for the university level, because that's when you start seeing more on the youth side and at the high school side, an achievable goal. Where are they going to take football and what can they continue doing after high school, for example? So I like to always highlight the pathways in sport and providing that gender equity perspective and what we're seeing um, on the women's side. And that might influence how you start integrating women into your programs for those who are listening in and as well and why you should be supporting the work that uh, women are doing in football, generally speaking. So when we think about keeping girls and young women in the game, what we see after high school is that 62 percent dropout of sport or any form of physical activity. It's actually quite a large percentage. And this is across Canada. So this is provided by the Canadian and Women in Sport Foundation. And let's say they do stay in sport. And of course, there's that angle of going the varsity route or in here in Ontario or professional. Um, and that's about 2%. So it's not a big number. But when we look at here, at the intramural side of things, those who are 18 to 26 years old that are women, only 26% stay physically active or are a part of a sport. So numbers are still fairly low. Um, same goes for how we're pushing our athletes into the, the direction of coaching or sitting on boards, being a part of um, athletic departments and running and leading those organizations. Again, what I want to highlight are a few things is that one, we need to keep uh, young. I think this extends to both boys and girls staying in the game. And the second component there is that there's more to sport, that there's that professional development. And it's all about how you sell that at different levels, right? You're not in the sport just for playing the game, but also what you can do with it in your real life after. So talking about our league, it's the Ontario Women's Intercollegiate Football Association. And what we do is provide that experience to play football. It's all student athlete run. Um, and it includes all of these great programs across the province. And I love to lay it out because then you can kind of see the growth of the game and how many women's teams exist currently. Um, and of course, all programs are somewhat within their different departments um, under the institutions. And look at these numbers. That, this is the number of athletes per university. They're pretty high. We have over 400 athletes competing right now. And my background is ensuring that they have a positive experience throughout all of this and delivering programming to build more women's football athletes, as well as uh, career and leadership development throughout, throughout their academic career. 
So who makes up our league? And again, I highlighted the number of athletes we have, but here are the actual teams. You can uh, visualize uh, the number of girls that are getting out there and competing. Uh, and this tends to grow from year to year. Um, and back in 2020, before the pandemic hit, we actually managed to host three tournaments. And I'll talk about our game in a second. Um, really awesome just to see uh, the number of faces that are involved in this program. And honestly, this league wouldn't be where it is today without those who want to keep the game going and keep those programs running at each institution. That kind of is an overview of the league in a sense that, okay, here's the, the demand. How do we make it so that it's a rewarding experience? And I just wanted to highlight four key points from my experiences building this league. One being, how are we, how are we recruiting and bringing in new athletes from year to year? And what can that look like from your end as a coach, for example? Next is that retainment piece. So athlete centric. So giving the athletes control over the programming that they're a part of, how do you do that? How do you make it so that they're building additional skills on top of just the training? We, cause there's so much to it. And if they feel more connected and invested in the game that they're playing um, by delivering programming or even supporting their own teammates, that really creates a positive experience and builds the overall cohesiveness of any team. Another thing I want to highlight is how to build these programs, how to start from scratch. How do you get the funding and that professional development piece in there so that things can continue from year to year. And then lastly, I want to provide that introduction into our game and how we've been able to integrate to contact flag and keep that going from year to year and the benefits of it and, and how it encourages all those elements of tackle, but to uh, a certain extent where you're replacing the tackling with the flagging. The recruitment, let, let me just give you an example. So when we're looking at the university lens and you're thinking about where you're getting a lot of your athletes from, for girls in the game and coming from high schools, there's about eight athletic associations across Ontario that offer flag football or touch football as a potential sporting experience. So I'm obviously using Ontario as an example. Um, some other provinces are a bit better with this in terms of what they have to offer at high school level, but it definitely varies across the country. But here in Ontario, we have eight. And of, that, of those eight, you can see the number of teams, which I put up there next to each association, that have a varsity or even a junior high school flag football team. And that means we have a huge resource to tap into to bring in new athletes, especially at the university level. So how do we target this group? And this can apply to any program. Um, and I've kind of broke, broken it down for you that if you're thinking of it at the youth or high school level, what that looks like. And what's key is making your program stand out. So if you are a coach that is um, getting a team going to compete locally, what about your program makes it special? Um, and for us, when I'm providing that lens from our league, a big thing that we, uh, tr at least as the president at Western, is that we're trying to get the best equipment possible. And equipment is minimal, but I mean, gear, you want to look good to feel good out on the field and doing that at reduced costs. And how do we re uh, remove that barrier of some of the the cost to either have that gear or get out on the field to participate in as many tournaments as possible, those resources will make your program stand out. And I'll talk about ways in which you can help with sponsorship and funding, and hopefully that'll help anyone who's running their own programs. Another thing you always want to make stand out is your staff, your coaches. What about them is unique and makes your program uh, a step ahead versus others. So even your own experiences, how do you sell that? How do you recruit your athletes so that they can believe in you as a coach? And that's a huge component because what we're working with at Western are a bunch of student volunteers. So what about our student volunteers make them um, suitable coaches for our athletes? How do, how do our women um, athletes believe they're in the right hands. So of course that comes with just being a part of the league for a number of years. And that's what we have. We have a lot of coaches that return from year to year. So just the number of years you've been coaching is a great start. Um, a lot of them tend to be OUA men's football athletes that coach our program. So what successes have you had as an athlete and how might that be something you promote to your own who are trying to join your team or become a part of your program? And then of course, uh, the next component there is what is what 
can any athlete coming through your program take away from that? So if they are going to play 18U, 17U, or they're going to move into the university lens, if they're going to be a part of your program, what opportunities are you going to open up? If they're going to go pro, okay, how are you going to promote that athlete when they're ready to go that direction? But if that's not the case, then what about the career development piece where they're not going to be playing for the rest of their lives, right? How are you building the skill sets so that they can then move into any career after? Another thing, again, is who are you appealing to? So if you're working at the youth level, you're trying to get parents on board. And how do you integrate parents into your programs? How do they feel like they're a part of it? If you're working at the high school level, it's, again, you're promoting one to parents and one to athletes. Where can they play and continue playing after? But also, can that help me get there through scholarship, money? That's what I love to highlight if you're going to, into the university realm to play your sport. Where can you take advantage of sponsorship, of scholarship? And that's kind of what has allowed me to attend university throughout my career because of sport. I put that down as a big leadership component of what I've done throughout the years. And I've been able to go through school and including my PhD uh, through a full, full ride scholarship. So those kind of things are really important. And of course, they got, they got to be doing law in school and whichever route they want to go. And then at the college and university level, you're actually appealing to the individual. For women athletes, it's like, Playing the game is one thing. Introducing them to football is usually later in their career. And for them to fall in love in the game, that takes some time. But if you can sell things like fitness, getting them into shape, that's a huge selling point because not only are they going to learn a game and have a kind of community, they're also going to get that physical output that many women do look for in the game. Um, and then, of course, career development. So where are they going to take what they've learned and apply it after? And then the last thing, and I think some coaches, especially those who have been in the game for a while, are getting more familiar with the tech aspect of things. So using social media, being on Twitter, being on um, Instagram, and how that is actually super effective at not just promoting yourself as a coach, but promoting your athletes um, and the programs that you have to offer. And that's something that I um, with our league, we tend to do for our teams because not all teams will be running their own social media accounts. So we do that. We showcase women in the game, et cetera. So how do we target this group? Um, some ideas that I love to share from what we, I've been doing over the years might be actual, might be helpful for each of you. So for Western's team, we do this mentorship type program within the team. So we have our veteran athletes that are often paired up or teamed up with someone new and a rookie coming in. So establishing those connections within a team early that is just that is beyond the game, but also understanding that there's a team dynamic component to it, knowing the ins and out of a new environment. How are you doing that for your athletes? And these are just kind of those unique ways of going about it. Creating resources and pro providing workshops. So some big ones include performance, nutrition. So we have this available on our website if, you, if anyone ever is interested in using it. But how do you eat to train and how do you recover after training with the way you eat? And that's actually changes the level of the game. So um, lots of sayings that were used in that performance uh, workshops, like before you go, you got to get the cho, meaning the carbs and the water. Before, uh, once you're done, you got to get the chalk, that those carbs, that water and the protein. So making sure that you know how to find that balance and making these resources available for your athletes so that they're excelling beyond just the game itself. Another one is mental health in sport. I think even on the men's side, that isn't spoken to as much and it's become more and more um, important because of course, mental performance is just as good as the physical. They go hand in hand. So making sure that your athletes have the right resources for that, even at the young level, who can they go to? How, who can they talk to about um, what's going on beyond just the field? So what I always say is, I hate when coaches say, forget what's happening out in the real world. Let's forget what you went through today and just focus on the field and just get your head into the game. That's not the reality of things. If you think of equity, diversity, inclusion in sport, a lot of athletes tend to go through a lot more than what they show. Um, and that can be uh, personal experiences, whatnot. And it's hard to just kind of forget that. And there's a lot of layers to it. So you have to think about ways to support athletes that come from those different backgrounds because it will affect their output on the field. And I think that's sometimes um, forgotten or ignored. Hence why I highlight why I hate that saying in a sense, because they can't just forget. So 
what is one athlete going through versus another? Um, and I always like to give the example of a lot of athletes have to pay for school. So they're working full time, then they're going through school full time, and then they have their own uh, at home things going on and they're expected to forget all of that and perform to the best of their abilities on the field. But there's, that's a lot. It's a lot for one person. And sometimes they need that additional support to be able to excel. So being able to provide resources for that is important. Even if you're just running an individual team, you got to think about um, your athletes in that sense. Another component is, especially in a pandemic, and Amanda's going to go through this, so I won't talk about it in details, but keeping um, those joints, keeping your body protected by training the right way. Of course, it's important, especially returning to sport. We don't want to be jumping back into full games, and then there goes the ACL. I've torn mine, and I never want to go through that again. So just those kind of things is why we want to protect um, and even just doing non weight related workouts to get that functional movement in super important. And that's what we've been offering our athletes during this time, things they can do at home, things they can do online, just to at least keep those movements there, that flexibility, there, balance before returning into full training, um, and sport. adding on to this is how do you come up with unique ways to connect with your athletes? And I say leverage anything within your area locally. So what our league has done to recruit, for example, is partner, of course, with uh, different organizations like the Argos. They're a great resource that one on the women's lens are trying to get a bigger fan base. So if you can bring more women into the game that sells more tickets, but two, they can also provide us with a lot of resources and training to help recruit and bring in high schools in the local Toronto area to come onto their fields, try out the game with our athletes and then learn about that university experience. So that's what we hosted. And I like to provide these kind of examples so you can think uniquely about how you uh, bring in new athletes and you build your own program. So um, we did this with the Toronto Argos. We made it a virtual event because of course, last year was a bit different for everyone. We included an interactive film review, much like these coaching sessions, but now with the athletes uh, reviewing tape and then learning about programs and how to get there. That's a big component. How do you keep going in the game? And what I want to say is big takeaways is to reach out to local organizations that might have these resources you can pull into and take advantage of. Don't ever hesitate on that, even if they are bigger names. And like I say, pinpoint things that are already available. So field space, if that's something you're paying for to rent out to use, can you find a group that has access to that or runs the field? Can you reach out to them about providing that as a free opportunity for your athletes? Um, for example, the Argos have, have a ton of film that they were able to break down and showcase to our athletes so they can understand the game better. Simple things like that, which requires no money on that organization's end. So retainment. And here's the athlete centric component. You're, what I like to highlight is that sometimes it's nice to be able to see your work come to life. So at Western's program, um, we have a team president, we have a team VP, and we have individual members who are responsible for things to help manage and run the team, which often a coach tends to do that completely. But, um, and if we're not thinking at the, the university level where you have a bunch of other staff, but even at the high school level, how can you get your own athletes to start taking on these leadership responsibilities to better the programming within your own team without it being all on you, right? And I think sometimes that can be overlooked because the capabilities of youth are huge. And of course, the university level, they're already uh, even a step further, take advantage of that. And I love highlighting how we have members in our own team that do those things along with the head coach, but um, who's the ones promoting us on social media. Sometimes your own athletes can do that better than yourself. So get them involved in that process. Um, if you have someone who can maybe go out and do the sponsorship running around for you and support that work, give that responsibility to an athlete and they can get some of their buddies to go out and reach out to different programs and teams. Um, and that's what I like to highlight. Uh, it's a great way to build leadership skills. And if it's not the athletes and you're working with groups that are even younger, involve the parents, like get them to work with their kids to get those output, um, those same outputs. And you'll have that same leadership effect um, and more control of the athletes and seeing how their development takes. 
Another example is our events coordinator to build to more team cohesiveness literally reached out to, for example, a bowling alley near Western and said, hey, can we come out and use your space so that we can have a social? Small things like that. Um, and oftentimes they'll be like, okay, fine. You can have this amount of food for free if you share this on social media two times throughout the night or three times throughout the night. And it's just taking advantage of those local groups and local organizations that can build your own programs and the experiences within your programs. Um, integrating professional development can be hard. As a coach, there's only so much you can do. Again, if you have that athlete-centric team helping you out, they can maybe set these things up for you. For us, some unique things that we've done is host panels and talks very similar to what is happening right now for our own athletes so that they can learn about going into uh, the world of coaching or football operations or into communications around sport. Um, and it's an awesome way to say, hey, if you can go beyond the game that you're playing and it, that's not what defines you. And I think especially at the university level for a lot of um, athletes, when they leave the game and have to start thinking about other things after that, they're like, oh my goodness, football was such a big part of me. How do I separate that identity for who I am now and where my career is going to go? And some go into coaching to keep the game in their lives as well, but some don't. And uh, having that transition and making that a bit smoother for athletes will really help with the kind of that mental health component and staying motivated after. So ways you can do this, like I said, a panel is a really great one. Doing resume workshops, get someone that you know who can help build resumes with your athletes, sit down even at the high school and university level. How can you write out your football experiences in a way that sounds appealing to a, a, an employer? Um, in youth groups do challenges and on top of practices to help kind of build the different skills, the life skills, the communication skills, et cetera, into practice. And I'm just going to highlight a panel that we hosted. So this was our women in football careers weekend. It was very, very much um, inspired by what the NFL has hosted in the past. And we had three panels that happened throughout the weekend where they, our athletes could ask questions directly and hear more about how to prepare for career in communications or in coaching staff or in football operations. Also, all of these workshops are available online. So if anyone wants to share it and watch it themselves, you're welcome to. I can um, share that in the links uh, as well. And yeah, and that there's more opportunity after the game ends is a big component. And it was nice because we had representation all the way from the NFL to the CFL in this event. So a big one is how to find funding opportunities. Even if you're an individual team, what does that look like? Where do you start? How do you, how do you go about it? And I'll kind of break down a little bit of a sponsorship sheet that I've put together in the past so people can get an idea of the language, how to navigate that and who to reach out to. So a big thing in creating your sponsorship letter and reaching out to groups is what is the goal of your program and who it, does it impact? How many kids do you have involved in it? How many athletes are a part of that program? Um, do you have an online presence? Again, I had mentioned that's so big now. If you have an online presence and a group wants to sponsor you, you now have somewhere to showcase your athletes and with that branding on there as well. Um, offer tiered sponsorships. So I'll, I'll highlight that too, where it can be anywhere from equipment items or gift cards that can just be given from the organization or group all the way up to monetary donations. And then provide a breakdown of what you can offer at each tier. So if someone is going to give you equipment or gift cards, what will, where, where will their brand go? Will it go on a jersey? Will it go on a backpack? Will it be on just social media? Breaking it down that way. And groups you can reach out to, of course. I always say local businesses because they're trying to give back to that region. So that's a big one. And if they are seeing promotions in that region mostly, they know that um, whoever is going to see their brand will then be able to actually go to their business because it's local. Um, food places are always great for hosting things like team banquets. Some people just totally miss that. Hey, they'll give us a discount on food if we host a banquet at their restaurant or something like that, or host it at a social. Another big one are car companies, brewing companies, banks. Banks usually have a budget and you should be reaching out around like the September mark before they're allocating money for the upcoming fiscal year, about 500 to $1,000 donation. They often have money budgeted aside to help local groups. 
Other ones are sport check, usually reviews every other week, any groups who come in asking for items or support. And you can actually ask them to consider you with that. And they just need a one pager as to who your group is. And they usually give out either gift cards, um, equipment, et cetera, to help with your programs. Jumpstart has some really good ones out right now. If you're looking at building um, kind of more coaches, the Canadian Association of Coaches offer um, sorry, the Coaches Association of Ontario, for example, will cover up, up to 70% of your NCCP training if it's multi-sport. Not many people know this exists, and I think it should be promoted across the board. But if you're trying to excel and increase in the level of your coaching, that's available. If you're going to support women in sport, there is so much money in that area right now that is looking to give it out um, just to build more women's program, get more women in the game, whether it be football or not. And don't be afraid to crowdfund. Start a go uh, a GoFundMe if you need to. They do take a small percent when you do a GoFundMe, but at least you can have some money to uh, apply back to your programs, whether that be from parents putting money in or local communities. And we've Western Steam has gone up to two thousand dollars, and it helps when local stations will take it up too, and we end up on CBC London in the morning because that also helps with promotion. Um, so before I move into the game, I'll just kind of give a, a highlight of my plays of what something I've put together before. Um, so I always like to set up a sponsorship letter with a letter that is personal directed to the individual so that they have an idea of, um, why we want their support. Uh, this was for an insurance company, for example, describing kind of the obstacles we face and why we need the money support uh, and where it will go. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Define here exactly where um, any support comes from and what you can do on your end. So this is the outcome. We'll mention you and tag you on social media at all times. We'll put you on our website Um Sit. And as we move up in the different tiers, so I did bronze, silver, gold, I'll put you on gear and um, team will attend your events and help as volunteers at your events, um, de depending on the organization or company. And then the last one, when the money is a bit higher to support our team is wearing their logo, um, including them on any major events that we host. So Western hosts a tournament every year, putting their brand up, allowing them to set up a table, a booth, et cetera. So that's what I just like to, to highlight there. Anyway, so that's enough talking about building programs. Um, I'm going to talk about the game. I won't get into the details too much because I think it's fairly straightforward in a sense. So in our version of contact flag here with the women's programs, and I put some pictures to highlight what the offensive line looks like and then how that transitions into the flagging for skilled players. We play 11 aside football and we set it up along the width of a Canadian size football field. So it's a fairly small field. And then we wish it was bigger. We can go full size. And if anyone is thinking of integrating this into a practice where they're eliminating the tackle for the time being with the pandemic, um, I would just suggest going full field. It's all the same. Um, we wish we could go full field, but it's just a matter of resources. So by having two fields present, we can host a whole tournament in a couple of days rather than kind of those one games at a time. But with how it works is that, the 11 aside football um, incorporates the offensive and defensive line. And I'll get into those details in a second where they're making the contact, but any skilled position on the offense or defense is wearing flags. So you're eliminating the flag flagging or sorry, the tackling and replacing it with flagging instead. Um, with our version, we get rid of the kickoff and kick return. Cause again, there's a big safety element there. So instead we just start at, for example, the 10 yard line, move up fields. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other layers there, but you can incorporate kicking and everything else. The same for that field goal or one point convert. And because we are playing 11 aside, we follow much of what kind of the NFL puts together here in terms of a set. So you can see here. We had the tight end involved instead of um, uh, other positions that you see with the CFL games. So feel free to adapt anything that I will chat about very briefly in terms of our playbook at Western and how we've kind of included the same elements of, of a tackle game, but without the tackling, you can get uh, similar things in there. So a lot of the questions come around the blocking rules. So here's just a breakdown of just general rules on, on how a line is set up, um, that each side of the line is 
protected in some capacity with another receiver on the line. So max of seven. Um, we work in a way that um, the line isn't eligible to catch a ball. It's fairly similar to, to uh, CFL rules. Um, you have to be off the one yard line. One thing we don't include in this game is like um, moving linesmen across so any pull blocking, nothing like that, just because of safety reasons. We do play in the snow. And I don't know if many are aware of that. And that adds a whole other element of challenge. So we try to keep things simple within the square of the body. Um, when the ball is off, you, you disengage from your blocking. Um, you can actually block downfield. So I'll show some plays as to what that looks like. Uh, and I describe here that what the contact blocking um, includes. So between the shoulder and the waist. So you, you're, you're still teaching the similar elements of, of, of engaging on the line. It's just now you're getting rid of kind of the, the bigger movements that push athletes to the ground than you would if you were um, able to tackle. And yeah, and you can rush the same way you have some of the same exact kind of gaps that you're working with running between gaps. And I'll show some examples of plays so you can see that as well. Um, of course, I got to showcase our athletes here. We're, we got a big team at Western. There's 60 girls on our program. Here's kind of how we set up on the defense and offensive end. I put their last names on, got to represent. Um, and again, the defensive line can set up how, however they wish, but this is usually our kind of base set. And then on the D here, we have a fullback and a running back as well incorporated in there and um, kicking personnel to Okay. So, and just to kind of wrap up, I know my time's coming to an end and I wish I had more film, but unfortunately um, our game isn't recorded as much as I would like. So I'm kind of going to give you an overview of, of what we put together. And I wish I was at the quick, or I knew quick pro who draw existed before, but we do the classic PowerPoint and drawing everything by hand um, to a whole without those base kind of uh, plays or um, routes lined up for us. So making these is literally like a week marathon. Um, but this is kind of because we have wristbands and we're able to put everything on for us. And it, it is that flag game. We basically put kind of the plays that are memorized or audibles and just the different spots and then incorporate some of the concepts that you see with the tackle game. But with our game, and I'll, I'll zoom in on these a bit more, but I just like to show kind of a general playbook. I can't give away all the goods for Western, but that's just how we work. All of our girls have to study this over the Christmas break, heading into the season and the new year. So we have like 40 something plays. Um, I think it's a bit out of hand, so <laughs> we might cut that down in the future. But we, have, <clears throat> of course, um, we of course have all of our different sets. So some of these might be familiar concepts already for some, the bronze, um, we give our things our own names. So here's for us sixes. So kind of where our RB set up, um, gunners, so trips. So how we have things set up on the right, we still have the line. I just am really trying to highlight how similar a lot of the concepts are moving into the contact flag game when it's 11 v 11. I, I know you have to integrate the Canadian rules and think of it that way, but that's examples um, when we have the RB and I and lined up behind the quarterback. Um, when we have two receivers, a kind of a balance set. We come up with weird names, so ignore those if anyone's wondering where we come up with this empty classic where the RB will move out of out of the backfield, uh, run downfield, and kind of I'll showcase some of my more favorite plays, which is Portland usually almost uh, always open with the tight end hitting the out there. Uh, again, I'm only giving an offensive lens because that is my realm. I cannot talk on, to the defensive side of things, but you can apply things, uh, I, I assume, similarly to any kind of defensive concept in the tackle game. Um, and again, we have a tight end in, in 11 v 11, but again, using very similar concepts, uh, QBs learn their reads, they practice things similarly. In a practice, for example, we do skelly like any other practice would run. We move people, uh, move out the line and the running backs and just do inside pass. So we get kind of all the similar elements of the tackle game, but without that tackling component and you're only seeing the contact on the line. Um, 
some very simple run concepts as well. Our, our line is really great at knowing how to open up these holes and our, our gaps. So we will have sometimes a full back run in there, clear up some space because you can block. So it can get physical. We move, push athletes out of the way. And then our running back usually gets pretty far down fields. Um, just let me know if I'm ever going through these too quick. We, we use motions again, because we <laughs> create this interesting hybrid of both the CFL and NFL rules. We can move from the, the back of the field as well before hitting the line, as long as seven are set. Um, and I'm happy to share a rule book if you'd like, if anyone would like it in more detail, but this is just a very high level overview of some of the play concepts that we'll incorporate. Um, yeah. And, and I, I'll kind of leave it, leave it at that, um, for, for now, but I'm happy to answer any questions or just chat. <laughs> so, yeah. And I can go through these plays more if anyone else is curious. That's awesome. Thanks, Olivia. Any, uh, any questions from anybody on the call? that you charge the kids to play yeah so it's all pay to play right um and how we do that is we have kind of a set standard cost but when we start factoring funding and all the other monies as well that that cost we try to reduce in as many ways as possible so things that are a set cost attending tournaments and just kind of the administrative work for, what, what would be the cost say for the kids so for our newbies coming in, it's at least 20 bucks. Oh, 120 bucks. I wish it was 20 bucks, $120 to play for a full season. That comes with a backpack, two jerseys, a sweater, um, and a, a jacket. So I can talk about kind of the connections I've made. And if you ever want to set up those kind of clothing areas as well, I can set that up with anyone who's interested. It's with Kahunaverse. So many might be familiar, but they've given us some really great deals on getting that cost low. And then tournament costs are in there. And then field space time if it's ever charged to us, but it hasn't been in the past. Returning athletes where they don't need to buy new jerseys, it's about $50 for the season. Um, one thing I saw one school do that I thought was really good, I tried to do it, was, um, you know, we had a program, like a uh, program that we would give out at games. And within that program was um, – uh, you know, the rosters and all that stuff that you would normally see. And then mm -hmm. there'd be a page with all the sponsors. And so what this school did, I think it was St. Francis Xavier was they told each kid, if you could bring in two or three sponsors mm -hmm. for the program, um, you would have your fee waived. And wow. so, you know, a lot of kids were going home in the summer and, um, you know, they would approach their employer and say, look at, this is what I'm doing. I'm playing on the team. I could, you know, you could really help us out here. And um, I never was able to get it implemented, but I know at, uh, I believe it was St. Vex, they had a, it was very strong. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it went a long way in terms of, uh, uh, you know, helping with that. Cause that, that's always a big deal. Um, you know, the funding aspect of things and, uh, our cost was, you know, we, we had, I know a lot of university teams, U sports, you mm. know, they're charging their kids like 400 or $500. And uh, that's a big thing um, for kids. And uh, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out at you. Yeah. And some schools can navigate things differently at the university level. So our Western program, for example, which is sometimes a good thing, isn't under our institution. So there's a number of layers to get through before a team is recognized by an institution. Yeah. But because of that, we actually can get away with a lot more cheaper avenues and we can get more sponsorship in different senses. Some things I like to highlight is even just asking the kids if their parents are willing to sponsor sure. it's a yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's always the case there's usually one who will provide an amount um uh, crowdfunding or keeping a spot open to just submit any dollar amounts that people are willing to donate obviously it helps if like for example a brewing company i don't know how that'll work with the high school level but amongst parents if you buy their alcohol they'll often do a kickback so keep your receipts, show us your receipts, and we'll give you 10% of that dollar amount of alcohol and their brand that you bought to give yeah. back to your programs. So 
um, you can find those a lot too. Um, I, I won't keep you, but the other thing too, that I always felt was really important and you mm -hmm. brought it up was, you know, what, you know, kids are wondering, you know, what's my future. And, um, you know, the one thing I felt was really important. I thought we really shortchanged kids was we never really prepared them for um, different things that they had to do in the business world, like how to prepare for an interview. And there was certain faculties, like the business faculty at my school was really good at this, mm -hmm. but other faculties were not. I saw many kids get a degree, a high level degree. And then the next thing that they're doing and not to degrade it, but they were basically just acting as fitness trainers afterwards. And mm -hmm. because that's all they knew, really. I mean, they had a degree in, um, you know, uh, a high level um, sociology degree or psychology degree, but they didn't know how to use it. And um, anyway, I, the one school I visited, which was really good, was, you know, they would bring the alumni on campus and they outfitted each kid with their own little business card. And so uh -huh. there, there would be, you know, 100 alumni there. And these kids were in the room with them and they would mingle with them and, you know, present their card. This is what I'm interested in. And this was a, I have to say, it was a very high level U.S. school, but still mm -hmm. it was, um, I just felt that was a big, big thing. You touched on it, was just being able to um, reach the kids that aren't going to be pros um, and that have to move on. And they're so valuable to your program. And yet they feel like their future is, uh, you yeah. know, they're, they're, it's questionable. And I think that's a really unique way about, uh, of going about it. And you can even think about that with your high school athletes is like right. career fairs or that resume workshop, setting that up, building those things and being able to walk up to someone and present that resume and say, Hey, this is why I'm interested in your, yeah. your place. This is why I'm going to uh, uh, try that out and how to sell it. Cause sometimes it's even just writing it out on paper is hard sometimes. Sure. So. Mm -hmm. anyway, um, yeah, Olivia, maybe we talk a little bit about um, your yeah. OFA affiliation as well. Yeah. I wish I had the big news to give just yet, but we're working on that right now. So our, our league is currently um, uh, pursuing the associate membership route um, so maybe not members exactly again for women's sport and with football and even at the football Canada level, we don't really know the dollar amounts that we put in and if that's going back to uh, women's programming specifically, right. That's a big question. Um, there's so much on the men's side, but I don't even know if we were to give a dollar amount to a group, where is that going on the women's side? So we're of course being as cautious as we can and figuring out what's the best route. So our affiliation is looking at that associate route and what that includes is a lot of support back into building these women's programs. And we sit now on multiple committees, Football Canada's Diversity Task Force, um, Ontario Football's uh, Female Football Development Committee, their non-contact committee. We're, we're there. We're providing our input and feedback. And that's how we're able to set up our affiliation. And hopefully we'll continue that in the future. Yeah. Do you get much help from the men's team at Western? Do you? <laughs> What's that like? Good, good question. I think that relationship might start to build a bit more soon. Um, but in the past, it's always been just some really great students, not on the men's team that has come out and helped coach us. And, and of course, if anyone's listening and wants to be a community coach and help coach our women's program, love to take you on here in London, Ontario. But yeah, it's um, historically with other schools, it tends to be their men's OUA guys coming in coaching because this is like perfect world to keep playing the game even though they're out of season so that's why and we play in march so they come in and they help coach and they build up our athletes and then they get a bunch of training in and then a lot of them go off to teachers college and now they can take what they've learned and apply it there so yeah i mean i, I know western for instance and i don't know if you're this sophisticated <laughs> in terms of no and when i say that i mean um do you use do you, you practice do you use cameras at practice our phone cameras <laughs> to the best that we can. We'll take well, it. And I'm going to put Greg Marshall on the spot here. <laughs> and you could tell him I said this, but uh, they've got three big league cameras there. You shot, you ought to go knock on his door and see if you could, uh, you know, borrow them in March because they're probably, you know, 
sitting yeah, on the shelf at that time. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I know. Film is like the next big thing for our league moving into the new year. Um, I do have some very crappy videos that I'm well, I'm happy to share if anyone would yeah. like to see them. But um, yeah, I can honestly, is it, is it okay if I just show one? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. I'm sure I have. Oh, I had it open a second ago. One second. Here we go. Um, my roommate is here too, and she's hiding, but she's also plays on the team. And I'm going to show that video <laughs> of her catching a touchdown. Let's see if I have it. Um, I did take a quick look at the depth chart. Who was the quarterback that threw that touchdown? Oh, it may have been me, <laughs> but no, no bias there. Oh no, it's not on here. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. I don't have that video right now, but I'll show this one. Oh, I wish it was bigger. Perfect world. It's, it's not there yet, but, um, <laughs> Let me just pause that and share my desktop. Okay, and then and that is for video clip. So hopefully this will work. So again, you can see here, girls lined up on the line. Why are you buffering on me? Let's hope this goes away. Um, our receivers are coming out of the backfield. They're running in motion. Um, it looks like some of these girls might be blitzing. Um, fairly fast game, usually pretty physical. Something as simple as that is usually what you often see in our game. Um, some other good ones. Let's see if I have a few more. Again, yeah, all great photo videos on the phone. Out, leg. Again, is a quick video, but just an example of, of what we do. Um, here's another good one with the tight end, hitting her on her out. See if I can zoom in on that. That's awful quality, this is in the snow. Again. That's just an idea of the energy, the vibe. Who threw that ball? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that was me. So wow. here's another one if you want to just see it for fun. Me getting like destroyed by a few players that we play on the house. Look, Riley. Yeah. Go get that. Riley. Riley. Super simple concepts. Yeah. And I'll, I'll leave that. I wish I had a good one of a run, but hmm. see what. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you had that ISO play drawn up, and I saw you can only use your hands. That's got to be tough running <laughs> that with snow on the ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the body control to be able to slow yourself up and only come with your hands, not throw a shoulder in it. And I'm not going to lie, the, the lines do get blurred sometimes. <laughs> so between the, the flagging and the tackling can be iffy, but we do our best. Now, uh, but there's no officials on the field, right? There are. They we don't have we have student volunteers who are officials. Again, I wish we had more resources, more money, but we train them up as best as we can, and they're the ones who are blowing the whistle, making the calls. Um, but yeah, so that those are the ones that are keeping the games in check. Again, tends to be the football guys. They know their game pretty well. It's just a matter of being able to see it all. That's a whole other story when there's yeah. A few few elbows on the line. It always comes in there. A little throat punch that no one wants to get, but uh, it's it's fun. Everyone loves it. <laughs> well, it was impressive to see just like it's like when you start putting the numbers up of how many how many players are actually participating. Like even your roster alone being you said sixty. Yeah. So I like, mean, I mean, what we do is try to emulate kind of what we've seen on the men's side, and we yeah. all coaches that were on the men's program so how we run on a field is that we have kind of our set line and a lot of girls that are cycling in because we play three games in one day and then a bunch of playoff games in the next day and if you're hitting on the line constantly or you're running up field on the snow your hip flexors your butt cheeks are sore the next day so you have to keep cycling in and usually we have them ready to go to play cycle in someone new they're calling in what the new play is from the line we're set up and ready to go it's really good stuff. Does the same quarterback stay in the whole time? 
uh, if we go up a lot, <laughs> quarterback might re- be removed. I mean, I'm not going to lie that our, our team is fairly solid on the Western end. So to brag, we were 18 and 0 ending off our season last year. We hadn't lost one. So, um, and for example, when I was showing games from the McMaster tournament, it was a good one. I had out over like 14 touchdowns in the, the six games that we played. So it's a lot of football, but, um, yeah, just a slight brag there and lots of touchdowns for some of our athletes as well. That's awesome. Well, thanks for putting together that presentation. That was very informative. Uh, Olivia, yeah. you you asked Sharps who Tom Brady's backup is and see if he knows, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. He just, uh, threw, he just threw a pass to the moon, so he can throw it to anybody, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia, I'm going to be in touch with you about that 70% off on the uh, – that's one of my roles here with the Peterborough football is the uh, sort of organizing coaches and stuff. So, yeah, that's definitely something we'll be in touch with. So. Oh, love it. Yeah, reach out. And uh, just to give everybody a little feedback here, I'm an old man who tries to get up with technology. I've had Twitter at one point, they shut my account down because I never used it. They thought I was a robot. And Olivia became, I think, my sixth follow and Paul was my seventh. And so, yeah, every day now I get a tweet from Olivia or it pops up, not to me, but I get a, a, a notification. So I check that now and I've actually started to try to move in. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more with Amanda. I'm into the Instagram world. That's That's me. So. Hey, both are great. Twitter's Twitter's the spot to get that like sponsorship in that like network with the bigger names. And then Instagram is how you get the athletes. That's what I usually find. Oh, okay. We'll see. There you go. I I don't even want to say I'm more or less just a Facebook person, but I'm pretty old. So <laughs> you're still on MySpace. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm still trying to figure out how to attach something on an email. Olivia, I put something in the chat there. I don't know if you saw it, but if you're looking for sponsorships and funding, don't forget community service organizations. They're in just about every community and they look for, for teams to sponsor and uh, give funding uh, to different community groups. So uh, put the touch on them. Yeah, actually, well, I think the Rotary group was going to actually be at our championship cooking up some barbecue for anyone coming out to the game so they're always a great resource i totally forgot about them but that's something we'll reach out to in the new year <laughs> yeah kin canada i'm i'm a member of them uh, and uh it's kinsmen and connect clubs so uh, they're in a lot of communities and uh, like i say that's what that's what they do oh, i love that okay thank you for so much it's super helpful you're welcome awesome well thank you olivia Olivia, I just wanted to say thank you for all you do for women in football and sports. I think it's amazing and it's super inspiring to see that because I'm just so excited. I mean, when I wanted to play football almost like eight years ago now, when I first started, there was nothing like this. So that's really cool. That's the goal. And uh, we've got, uh, Paul and I've got Olivia's information. So anybody, we've got uh, most of our familiar people on the call. If you're interested to find out more about Olivia, let uh, let Paul or I know, and we can definitely um, set up something here. And uh, as I say, if there's anything that comes to you after the fact, I know Jason's on the call. He's uh, he's one of our new uh, new organizers of the um, Flag League in Peterborough that, uh, that they've just recently started as well. So we might have some more questions, Olivia, and maybe we can even get it together and have an exhibition game one time. And that would be cool for the kids to see just how fast that game was, right? It's uh, looked pretty fast and pretty yeah. physical. So I'm, so I'm going to add a good. quick thing in there in London, there's no opportunity to play football for the girls. And so we're literally going to be competing with the high school flag programs and playing that way as well. So always down to show some showcasing of the game. And Olivia, check the chat there. A couple, uh, Richie Hall and Gabe Robinson both put just a couple, uh, a couple of good jobs in there as well. So. Um, yeah.